<laughs> All right, and we're live. Thanks so much for joining us for the Q2 podcast sponsored by Penvisio. I'm your host, Joe Lopez, and with me is someone who is uh, very patient and very <laughs> understanding, uh, Dr. Watson Swale of the Education Policy Institute based out of D.C. Uh, we tried to connect earlier, um, and uh, we had to, you know, had to figure out some things with technical snags, and uh, he's with us now. So thanks so much for joining us technically again for the show. Yeah, it's a pleasure both times. <laughs> thanks so much. Um, for anyone who uh, we connected at the at, at a conference before, and um, you know we I, I, I subscribe to your email newsletter, and so I kind of know uh, the, your background and how you got to where you go where you are now. Um, can you kind of give people the few people who don't know who are listening, um, how did you get into uh, the policy uh, institute? And you know, we'll dive into the article that I picked up on not too long ago about uh, why you're passionate about this space of higher education and bridging that with the world of work and, and those, uh, those worlds. Well, um, a little background for you. Uh, uh, I come from a, a long history of education from a classroom teacher uh, way, way back in my native uh, Canada, in Winnipeg, Canada. And I taught for five years uh, there and I decided to do some graduate work. So I ended up uh, coming south of the border to um, Norfolk, Virginia, and Old Dominion University, where I did my master's. And then I taught for a couple of years in Hampton, Virginia. And I decided to go do my my doctor uh, doctorate at George Washington University. So I moved to D.C. with a very young family at the time and uh, did my doctoral work there and ended up going and working for the college board. Uh, the, the shorter story is I ended up staying in D.C. for 12 years and in the last two years started uh, after working at a several places, College Board, SRI International, the Pell Institute. I started uh, uh, the Educational Policy Institute. Then at that point we realized we could do it almost anywhere so we moved back to the Tidewater area of Virginia and uh, we've been in Virginia Beach ever ever since doing this. We've had offices in various places, but we found it, it, today things are so virtual now that yeah. we just have people all over the place. So that's how I got here. In terms of uh, the writing, I've always written a lot. And if people end up uh, going to the, uh, the website, uh, educationalpolicy.org, uh, they can see some of the things there, but you can also go to the Swale letter dot com and see my almost weekly blogs. I sometimes don't write them every weekly because uh, either it just doesn't come to me or I'm just not, uh, my biorhythms just aren't in, in sync for it. So, but I do like to talk about, as you know, uh, because you've seen me speak before up at the Tri-State. Uh, I think that was in uh, Westchester or White Plains. And, uh, you know, I've spent a career working on issues of educational equity uh, college access and success, affordability, among a bunch of other issues, but those are kind of the core issues of how do we get uh, uh, students, especially those who are from low-income backgrounds, Pell eligible, uh, those who are of color, uh, those who are, as we like to say, first generation and historically underrepresented. How do we kind of try and level the playing field for that? And so that's really what I've worked on for my career. So uh, I, I came in with the, um, after hearing you speak, subscribing to the newsletter, and hearing, uh, reading this most recent article uh, regarding the world of work and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the over-professionalization dynamic in higher ed, but also most recently with this shifting tide um, regarding where jobs are growing and then what are the what are the unique qualities that are different um, uh, now compared to when jobs grew, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? Um, you start off with a quote, which I thought or a point that I thought was interesting um, regarding uh, students should think like investors when it comes to picking a college and then also um, in 
a college major and you kind of agree with it, but you kind of disagree with it. I wanted to kind of, you know, ask you to elaborate on where does that analogy go wrong when in this context, when you're telling students to, you know, college is just like a, you know, ROI. What's your return on investment? You got to think like an investor. It's re it's a tough situation. It really is a tough situation uh, for a number of pieces. And the article you're reference, referencing, I put out just a couple of weeks ago, using some recent data from the Bureau of Labor. And uh, it looks at uh, what, what jobs are in the growth area, uh, as well as what education is required for them. So there's, there's a few different philosophical bents on this. Historically, we've come across saying, well, come on, we want everyone to have equity. We want access to higher education for everyone, regardless of cost and, and other things. So we want everyone to have that. And if you look at the rates, you know, people who are low income, people who are black, Hispanic, uh, Native American, uh, they don't go to college at the same rates and they don't complete college at the same rates. Uh, they've, the gaps have lessened over the last 30 years, but not near to the level that you want to. So you want more to go. And people like to show a graphic that says, well, the more education you have, the more you earn. Okay. Um, and that's true, but it, it also hides a lot of other stuff that's going on there too. Their average earnings as well. And when everything's average, you know, there's people who make yeah. more and there's people who make less. And guess what? The same people who have less access, they come out with a bachelor's degree. They don't usually make as much as some other people who have a bachelor's degree. So it's people throw this figure out saying, well, you make a million dollars more over a lifetime with a bachelor's degree. Well, some people do. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we've actually seen a flat flatness of that over time. The professional degrees keep on increasing. So if you're a lawyer, a doctor, uh, accountant, those keep on increasing, but standard bachelor's degrees uh, do not. Uh, so you have to look at that. So that, that's the one side of it. There's another side of it, and that's where are the future jobs. And uh, a lot of people who are the proponent of the access issue don't really like to talk about this. Agreed. Uh, and it baffles me a little bit because I just don't hear much about it. Because people say, well, you're going to need a bachelor's degree. Uh, you're going to need some higher education, some post-secondary. Um, but they really pin a lot on a bachelor's degree. Um, and I don't subscribe to that. And again, I'm very careful here, right? Because it's antithetical to the access movement. Yes. But at least on the surface level, it is right. Yeah. On the surface level. Yeah. But once you dig down, you go, well, you know, we have to think about a bunch of other things that we may get into today, including, well, student debt and, uh, and the weight that we put around students, uh, shoulders that they spend 20, 25 years trying to repay. But back to the future uh, jobs out there. Well, there's a few things going on. First of all, there's the grain of America and the world, but let's just keep it at America right now, is there's the grain. So the baby boomer uh, population, uh, they're all retiring and they're going to live way longer than the previous generations, right? Mm -hmm. So guess what? Home health care. And those in healthcare related issues uh, are by far going to surpass in terms of the number of job availability. Well, why is that important? Because really none of those jobs or very few of those jobs require any post-secondary education. They don't require certificates. They're usually on the job training. Uh, the other thing is the technology piece. Now, if people go in and they get computer uh, programming uh, degrees and certifications that I think they're pretty safe. I think those are very, very good jobs for the future. Uh, but as we're hearing with Tesla and all these other things and automation and including Uber, people think Uber is a job creator, but it's a job take away or because they don't want to have, they don't want to have any drivers, <laughs> right? That, that, that's really what they're after. So we're going to have to deal in the next 20, 30, and 40 years of this real issue that technology is going to take a lot of jobs away. So there's no degrees you can take to battle that one. Mm -hmm. so we don't know where some of that future stuff is, but 
in that one article, I listed the jobs and then the top 10, um, you know, you don't need a bachelor's degree for, for any of them. And then the earnings are pretty low. If you could talk yeah. about the earnings potential with the jobs that are, are actually growing. Yeah. Well, there's a challenge on two levels for that, right? One is, uh, uh, is the jobs that are available and are they full time? Or are they going to be 35 hours or 30 hours or part time? Because what happens when they're part time, right? No benefits. Yeah, you don't need to have health care as a company. Uh, let's go back to the idea of Uber. People who are doing Uber for a full time job, and I'm not sure the percentage of drivers that are, it's probably this big, but let's say that 15% of Uber drivers are full time. Uh, well, what does Uber do? There's no benefits at all. Your contractor only. Zero. It's 1099 miscellaneous uh, on a tax code. Uh, so you have that issue there. Then there, there's a quality of work as well. So I'm a big thing on the, the, the benefit piece because uh, I know as a small business owner, we deal with the health care issue. It's, uh, it's horrible uh, for us. And uh, uh, it was horrible before the Obamacare. It's horrible yeah. after the Obamacare. But those things are really going to take a, a big bite out of small businesses for sure. And uh, you know who ends up losing? It's the worker. Yeah. You know, the business hurts. The workers lose the most. So there's a lot of unknowns knowns in the future. Um, so there's a lot of places we can take that. Mm hmm just for people who are listening, a lot of them have a higher ed background. This is, and this is irony for me that gets me kind of fired up and, you know, um, baffled is that higher ed is a place of higher learning. And in an ideal situation, uh, we would be in front of this or be able to, um, you know, be ahead of the curve in adapting and changing and those kind of things. Um, being that you speak across the country, do a lot of research, um, how do you find higher ed as a whole handling this unknowable world? I mean, you can only prepare so much, and I, I granted that you can only do so much, but um, there, I have the hunch and suspicion that it's business as usual, and um, despite innovation being named in their mission statements and vision statements, um, there's not enough happening in enough in a short amount of time that's needed to make this um, to turn things around for a student who's going into massive debt or you know spending a lot of time their best years of life try, trying to find themselves and find their their purpose in life well again you we go back to a philosophical piece first what is the purpose of higher education and what type of higher education right uh two year two year or less four year professional degrees uh, and the answer depends on who you ask, right? Yeah. Uh, if you ask a professor at uh, an exclusive institution, um, they're going to talk about, well, we're, we're paving the road for society in terms of citizenry, and we're making better people. Um, and that's all true. <laughs> that is 100% true. I never argue with that. But let's face it, college is also vocational preparation. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't be pushing as many people to and through it. It was very different, uh, you know, 67, well, let's call it pre-World uh, War II, the GI Bill. Uh, before that time, you know, 5% of the country went to college, okay? Uh, and now, it, in terms of some college, but uh, now 25% go to a four-year degree program and uh you know around 50 percent go to go to college or so uh, a little more more than that actually uh so it's a different world now in terms it was pretty easy to have this attitude before of saying well we're preparing the our best for the nation to make the nation better we still are doing that but we're preparing a lot of other people for other jobs even at the four-year level you know the rns uh, there are technical things going on uh the, the uh just people who work at jobs that aren't professions, but their English and their grammar and their writing ability and their speaking ability come into play, right? Uh, those things matter, but that's a philosophical piece as well. It comes back down to the issue of, uh, you know, our purpose. 
And does the purpose of higher education match the needs of the workforce? And again, back to that article, looked at uh, what are the primary things that uh, business leaders say that they, mm. they want from a graduate. And matter of fact, I've got it here. I got to put on my glasses. I'm sorry to, to read them. But they always came down to what well, were the top 10. Number one was communication, or it is communication, I'll say in the present tense. Two is teamwork, three is leadership, four analytical and research, and five organizational. There's other things on the list as well. Uh, but it makes me go, okay, what does higher education and specifically the four year programs, are they preparing? students and graduates with those things and i think we would argue in many cases yes they are but i think there's a whole swath of students that don't get that mm -hmm. and i think institutions have to be better at ensuring that in any degree program that these things happen uh, and if you ask any student they say they hate the team room stuff mm -hmm. but there's a reason that that businesses ask for it because almost everything in business is teamwork uh, you know, we work, uh, as I said at the start of the show, we work uh, virtually mostly, but it's teamwork, you know, 100%. It's, it's absolute teamwork. It's just done through a different uh, vehicle now. Uh, look at you and me right now. I'm looking at your photo. You're looking at mine, and I'm not sure what people out there are going to be able to um, uh, see, but, you know, th this is teamwork of just a di different ilk, and you can train for it that way. So back to your original premise on this is I kind of agree with you uh, that I don't see higher education doing a whole lot of anything different. Mm. And that doesn't mean places aren't doing things differently. That would be unfair to say. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing online and they're doing blended learning. They, there's some really good things that are going on in many, many institutions. Uh, I would say most institutions are doing some really good, good work. Uh, but very few institutions are taking it up a notch. Yeah. And they're saying, well, this is what business and industry are doing, but they're not matching it. They're not matching it with degree programs uh, because you know what, professors for the most part, they latch onto their degree programs and they teach them for the rest of their lives. Some of the courses will evolve and change, but for some of these degree programs, they're outmoded. You know? Or do I say that the jobs are going? Uh, and I think that's really, especially for public higher education, private, you can do what you want, you know, but uh, people will still vote with their feet. But for public, we're putting in incredibly large subsidies to ensure that we're educating people to things to make society better. Okay. So I, I think we have to do a much better job on that, or we're going to be in a big issue uh, of just employing people. And we've got a problem, actually, that so many people are over-educated for the positions they're taking. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Um, I think uh, I'm just this past couple months after doing some more and more research and speaking to more experts, and just also my, I have a, a background in sociology um, and seeing how in over history, like we just have a really hard time learning things as a society fast enough for the upcoming swing. Like, um, we just, it's just a human element, I guess, uh, magnified at a societal level that we see trends for a long time before we feel it enough to actually do significant change. And, um, I'm just kind of like the hopeful, the hopeful side of me, it says, well, because it's higher ed, we have, we're in the information age now more than ever, we have a chance to actually make, be the exception and make those changes in the front. But after years of doing the show, like just been about two, two, three years, and just reading what I'm reading. And also, um, I used to work at an institution connecting with students and working at the, another uh, uh, place where I worked with students from across the country. I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm becoming a little more cynical lately and um, wondering what's going to be that, that tipping point to make that shift happen. Um, because it's, the debt is a real issue. And, um, you know, there's calls that we're becoming a gig economy where everyone's going to be a freelancer eventually. Everyone's going to have to tap into some type of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial type of skill set that they have to develop, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to I'm trying to share the message of 
be act like an entrepreneur now at the worst case scenario when you do find a placement appointment you're just that much more valuable and worst case scenario you're a little ahead of the the learning curve than others who kind of assume that the nine to five job with good benefits is no longer there um you know uh, ironically um a lot of the top five things you listed off that list um they are the domains of liberal arts yes and and that's you know do you see liberal arts kind of like taking advantage of that so far or is it just pretty much they're 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 not really uh channeling that philosophy of being critical thinkers and those kind of things um into this new world of work yeah i i think you're dead on there that's why i'm i'm always quick to say that uh, people don't think liberal arts have a a place in this uh brave new world uh i think it's massive because you need people who not only can just communicate um but they can comprehend and i think the comprehension piece uh that they can read they can think they can comprehend historical knowledge um you know we don't want history to repeat itself right you only know that from uh, the strength of understanding the history i think a lot of things we see politically and other things are people who just don't remember history oh, say, well we've seen this stuff happen before so i think liberal arts is is incredibly uh, important but you do raise a i think a more important point here is for the youth, you know, the 18 to 24 year olds who are in their prime college age. And, and I think it's always interesting because people often talk about non-traditional students in higher education, how it's changed so much. It hasn't changed that much. Mm. Uh, those are great talking points. They're just not true. Uh, there may be true in certain places and there's more adults going to school, but you know, the, 80% of uh, higher ed students are traditionally aged higher ed students. So they're going to college. And as you may know, a lot of them go to college and they're not sure exactly why they're going. They just know that it'll be better for them if they do. Yeah. They're not sure what they want to do, uh, but they're going to put their, their time in. So they're going to put their four or five or six years as a starter oh. place to try and secure some type of job out there. But if they don't pick up some of those skills along the way, they may have trouble, if not getting a job, uh, keeping a job. Uh, there's not a lot of data. I don't know of any data on that. Uh, and I'd love to see it. Is There is some on what we call gainful employment. People who graduate, what happens to them? Do they get jobs? We don't know that much about people who get jobs in their discipline. And we don't know, to my knowledge, any knowledge of those who are able to keep their jobs. Uh, because that's one of the indicators, isn't it? Say, well, you might get a job, but if you can't keep a job, you know, some of those skills on that list did not take hold. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it's kind of a scary place. Add on top of that, just the cost of a higher education and the debt loads that students are taking. Um, states and provinces aren't keeping up with their subsidies the way they used to. So tuition and fees pay for a larger chunk of it than ever did before. Yeah. Uh, and that means that, uh, you know, parents and, and students are, are paying a whopping amount for, especially a four year degree, uh, you know, and if they can't get a decent job after that, those debts, you know, at five and 6% percentage rates, escalate over the years it's like having a mortgage uh, degree without the house it's um, very scary um I, I know especially when you're under that kind of weight financially and the job search and i've been there where you're you're searching for a new job um the psychological impact is could be devastating and i'm yeah. you know i'm an ambitious person um mm -hmm. I, I again i do i freelance on the side um and I, I have contracts and clients um, and still like when you're searching for, for clients to search for work or a new job, it can have, a, and I think that's the part where we forget, um, because a lot of this is, we look at numbers and we look at the stats and we look at trends and, 
um, when we go to these conferences, higher ed professionals are just nodding their head, and then you know they they go back to their campus, and we're, with very little to no change, what's what gets me fired up is the fact that in scale, on mass, when students are having this kind of um, weight on their shoulder, the psychological and emotional impact isn't always in the equation when we're doing these reporting, and that does have an impact on this next um, this next wave of workers. And are they going to bring their best self to work? Are they going to show up motivated, creative, you know, eager to solve problems? And we lose such a we lose that fire. Um, I think we lose that ability to solve some of the problems that we're facing as a country as a whole. Um, that's well, lay, that's lay over top of that, though. Now, now with everything that you just presented there, lay over the talk anything that we've learned about millennials. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's so much upside to the millennial population. But there's some there's some negative sides to it as well. Just like with any generation, there's pros and cons, but not that we're yep, picking yep, millennials. Like, like everything. We and, have to and do that disclaimer of, all the time right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and one of them is just the fact that understanding that a career takes a while to develop. Yes. Uh, and you don't just walk into this higher position because it takes 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, to really get your feet secure in, in a career and uh, and I, I think for, for some of those who are having trouble getting decent jobs uh, or who get entry-level jobs and they're just going well I've this one pressure of finance on one side saying well I don't even know how I'm gonna pay this off and I'm seeing that the light at the end of the tunnel it used to be about finishing your degree yes that was the light at the end of the tunnel now you're entering the workforce and you're going, wow, this tunnel just got longer because now I've got $80,000 in loans uh, and and I'm trying to figure out how to pay rent yeah. You know, after I move out of uh, my parents' basement uh, that I just moved back into yeah. <laughs> you know, or something like that. So I, I think the psychological piece that you mentioned is, is really important because I think it's very hard for – a lot of young people and a lot of young college graduates, whether it's two year, four year, rather, they don't see a, always a really positive place out there. Yeah. They see a lot of pressure, uh, a pressure to pay, pressure to do things. Uh, and I think it's hard. Uh, but on the flip side of it, again, on the, on the millennials, especially, is there is a more nurturing part of it at the same time and a more belief in society. So I think it depends which way you wake up and which way you yeah, get off the, yeah. off the bed in the morning. Uh, but the challenges I think are really, really dramatic for these uh, younger students. Um, I wanted to play a game. And, <laughs> oh. uh, it's, it's a, a, it's basically a, 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 a easy game. You have three rooms. The first room is you're walking into um, a, bu a bunch of students uh, who are sitting down waiting for you to speak. And they are here because they want to hear the best advice about their next chapter in life. They're, they're, they're in the college search stage. You know, what would be some of the things that you would say and encourage them to do as they prepare for this next chapter? Uh, look for opportunities. Uh, open the doors. I just, a lot of us reflect on our own experience, but... I made a career out of going from one opportunity to another that presented itself. Uh, I'd like to think I helped it present itself. Uh, I think an education does that. I think parenting does that. A lot of other things um, and, and, and opportunity. Uh, but I think you have to look for the opportunities and try and make things happen. So the education is a vehicle to help get you an opportunity. But if you think that it's going to do all the work for you, you're just wrong. You you have to take it like a brand and sell it. That's right. You were talking at the outset about on entrepreneurship and and those things, and you have to, if you can't sell yourself, no one else is gonna. That's right. Uh, so I think you say you have to get into a self marketing thing. You have to understand what you're good at. You have to understand what you're not good at and what you don't like to do. And then don't do those things if not yeah. possible. 
Um, you know, find the things you're good at and you like, if possible, and go and try and find those jobs. If it means moving somewhere and trying something for a bit, if you're in your 20s, that's the time to do that. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's one thing I'd say in that room. Okay, cool. But I'm sure there's other rooms, right? Yes, sir. They're coming up now. Um, so now you walk out, they're, they're just thanking you, standing ovation. You go to the next room, and now you have um, career service offices and directors and associate directors and um they're looking at you a little confused because they hear all the reports and they're too busy in the office trying to help students to really get a handle of what's around the corner um some are indignant they don't like what they're seeing they don't believe it some are looking for help what do you say to career service uh, departments uh give your head a shake uh that, that's easy answer um, and I get that, I, especially the uh, advisors and those career professionals at the institutions who are advising students, or maybe even in, in high school, right? Uh, and this is where we have that challenge with the Philosophy. equity agenda, Yeah, uh, is that the reality is college is not for everyone. It's mm-hmm. just not for everyone. Not everyone likes to learn that way. Uh, you're asking people, a wide wide group of people who didn't like K-12 to education to go for another two or four years in a system that is, is different but similar. You know, obviously, it's not high school anymore. Yeah. Uh, the two-year institutions are more like high school than the four-year, uh, but, but there's difference and similarities in it. But you're asking them to do more when perhaps it's just not good for them. The second thing is look at the trends and where the jobs are, uh, which I have done, and understand those. And I I think, especially in high school, for high school counselors and that, so many students go to college because their parents expect them to. Of those that do go to college, for many of those who don't go to college, they never have anyone advocating for them. That's a different, we'll do that over another topic someday, right? Uh, and that's a different challenge, but let's just talk about those who do go. A lot of them go and they're going because their parents told them they should go and everything else and they don't know. We, we talked a little about that. Uh, but they don't really have uh, um, either a, a navigation aid on their smartphone to say, where am I going? Uh, where they're going is to graduate from this degree program, but they still haven't figured out what they want to do. Uh, I think uh, these aptitude tests and career exploration uh, inventories and others are really, really important Mm. for students before they go and maybe even when they're going. Because if students are in there and after a semester going, I hate this, Uh, which is one reason we have general ed courses. So you can sample a little, Um, you know, don't stay in it. Um, A lot of people say, well, People change majors and it sets them back. People changing majors saves their degree. That's true. You know, uh, a lot of people look at it as a, uh, a negative. If you change it three times, that's a problem. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you change it once, I change my major. I How many people change their major? I, I don't know what the percentage is. It's got to be at least a third, I'm guessing. It yeah, might even- I heard, uh, yeah, it's, it's up there. You know, it's, there. it's, it's generally a good thing because you say, oh, I don't like this and I saw this and I talked to my friends and I think I like that more, change your major. Uh, But at least have the opportunity to reflect a little, be reflective to understand that a, that you can change things, that you can change direction and it's better if it happens earlier than later. But you probably think of a lot of your friends and perhaps family and others who end up earning their degree And then they're going, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, I didn't really like doing my program. Um, But what they've got is they do have a piece of paper to help sell themselves. And they might use those skill sets, the communication, the teamwork, right? Which is why it's so important. But other than that, they're probably not going to use some of the other things they learned in there. Uh, So I I think it is uh, important to to self-advocate. And I think these career people have to understand that. We've got to teach students to be self-advocates, That's right. to know what to do. 
And we've got to be more honest with them about the jobs that are out there and what it takes. Just one little uh, description. I remember talking to uh, a young lady in Hampton, Virginia, when I was just doing a research project there just a few years ago. And she was an eighth grader, eighth grade student. And, uh, and she wanted to be a nurse. And so we asked her, we were doing focus groups with kids there um, on a federal evaluation. And she, we said, do you know how much college you need to do to become a nurse? And she said, seven years. And we just said, okay, you know, seven years, you can be a doctor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you could be an MD in a little over seven years, not counting residency, but uh, uh, you can be in residency, I think, at seven years. Uh, perhaps, but you know, you can be a nurse in two years, right? Um, you know, community college, uh, uh, program, that's really all you need. Uh, you don't have to be a four year RM. Uh, there's not near as much value added as they like you to think, but here's someone who in their head, whether they were told this or just assume that they need seven years of college after high school to become a nurse. Well, if, if that's what someone believes, how many people would opt out of college? Because they're misinformed. You say, you know, if you go to the, that would be Thomas Nelson Community College, you can be an RN right then. You know, uh, in two years, and you can be making a decent living uh, to start. I agree. I understand the, the lack of information. Now, here's the information gap. Now, I'm going to yeah. chime in real quick because I have a story, too, uh, that can, that's, um, I had to really compose myself. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I had to really compose myself because I just got done speaking about students and how they can take their, um, you know, their passions and be a, a entrepreneurial and be a social entrepreneur. And that'll be a nice intersection of doing things that you like and enjoy with career development and self skills. And you don't have to wait for an internship to give you the thumbs up. Just start calling nonprofits and trying to volunteer and pitch projects. There's that selling communication skill set there. Um, at the end, he came and he was like, oh, I like everything you said, but she has one problem, you know? Um, and it was a career director. Um, the, the students are in the faculty. They're in the faculty rooms. They're in the classrooms mostly. We can't, we can't force them to come in. You know, it's really faculty's job to really bring them in. And I had, there was a student there that was a, who was uh, waiting to ask me a question. And I had to really compose myself because here we are. Um, they're, they're the ones getting in debt. Uh, they're the ones that they don't know what they don't know. And uh, we have all kinds of tools and techniques to reach students where they are, but they're not being tapped into. And so the I, I too, have seen firsthand the huge gap from the student's perspective, but also a staff perspective on the world of work. And that's why I really want to have you on because, you know, you're producing these materials and this content and I want to help spread it out to, so these career service professionals can really be informed and get ahead of these trends. Um, but that was really, there's an information gap on both sides, I find, um, on that level. Um, well, and even to make that even more challenging, uh, high school, middle and high school counseling has gone the, almost the way of arts in the schools. It's so sad. They're, they're, the first thing is to cut. And counseling, which I think kids need more of now, they're getting less of it. Yeah. And, you know, in many schools, counseling comes down to truancy uh, more than counseling. But if you really want to have college counselors, uh, and if you want to call them, car, call them life counselors or whatever you want, term, yeah. and just say, you know what, if you really don't know what you want to be, here's some options. We've done your aptitude test. You seem to be really good at this or really interested in this. You know, here's a one year program that can matriculate or transfer into a two year or a four year program. And you can go and get your feet wet in it mm -hmm. uh, and see if you like really doing it and get a certificate at the same time. It's one of the wonderful things. That's why if people are technical, there's a real advantage being technical, whether we're talking about IT, computer, or, or something else, because in nine months you can get, a, or less in some cases, you can get a certificate and be valuable as a commodity. Yeah. You know, whether you got your C++ or your Microsoft, uh, uh, different types of certifications on there. There's even in project uh, management, not even like the technical as in like computer stuff, but even mm -hmm. just managing information and managing projects. 
Um, there's a PM, I think PM, some, I think PMI, where there's you get a certificate there. Six Sigma is another big one, but it's a little advanced. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a, but it's a good thing to know. But if counselors are up on that, and if students have access access to counseling, uh, it opens their eyes. And uh, I know I was fortunate; I had good counselors mm -hmm. in high school that I'm still in touch with. Like, wow. a, how many years later? A lot. Yeah, same here. Over over thirty five years ago, I'm sure. Um, I, I I don't want to do the math. Thirty seven <laughs> years ago, as I graduated from high school, and and I'm still in touch with my two counselors. Uh, why? Because I just trust, I learned to trust them more than anyone. Mm. They told me what I needed to know, the good, the bad. Uh, they made sure I know they, um, you know, and I just went to, to college locally at the University of Manitoba. But so I wasn't like off and about, but, uh, you know, there's something about having that trustful person that can tell you things from experience, but also because it's their profession and their profession is to help launch the lives of youth. Yeah. And that's why it's critical. And that's why it's really so sad right now that there's not enough. I do tell this to colleges. I say, uh, don't assume that your students come to you knowing what they want to do. I say, uh, if they do not, then it's your job to ensure that they have that opportunity. Yes. So two-year and four-year institutions should be running students through career exploration pieces and have them. Two-year institutions are much better doing it than four years. So let's save a little bit. That may be a good subject for the third room because the third room is filled with presidents, vice presidents, academic vice presidents, top head ponchos running the show. They want to do what's right for the students and they want to be, they want to live up to their mission statements and vision statements. What do you tell them? What's the good, bad, and ugly truth that you got to tell them? Uh, on the positive side, I, I guess it's the positive side. I think you have to tell them, say, and I do tell this to, to leaders all the time, say, your number one focus is on students. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you know that, but it really has to, it has to emanate from the highest person at the institution. And it's got a, I don't believe in uh, trickle down economics, mm -hmm. but I do believe in trickle down leadership. Mm. Uh, whereas That's you good. have to showcase it from the start, from the top. And you have to show how important it is, how we treat students, how we support students. That's what we're here for. The other things that go with it, they're all important. Fundraising, research and development, if that's what you do. Um, uh, financial aid, all the, the nitty gritty of running a college, they're all important. And every president will tell you how much time they spend doing all those things. Uh, and it's true. But every aspect of it, the first question is, like, what does this have to do with students? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just keep that focused. It's like having a lens on. Yeah. Say, always, first question should be about students. And then it doesn't mean that we're not going to do that. Uh, you're still going to do all these things, but keep that uh, that lens on about doing it. So that that's one of the main things I'd say. The other thing I'd say is be careful of uh, mission creep. Um, I, I think too many presidents they want to make their institution something it isn't. Mm. Uh, they all want to be. They look at their peer institutions. And, you know, when you've got a gauge here of uh, this is you and this is your top peer and here's your lower peer, everyone wants to get to the top peer, okay? But there's usually some big differences between who they are and who you are. And, and institutions shouldn't forget that. Sometimes you're here in this peer because you do other things better. Okay? Your mission's a little different than some of them. Don't assume that if everyone was the same, what diversity of institution would we have? Uh, I, I think more presidents should live within who they are as an institution rather than trying to break out uh, and, and keep the focus on just trying to be the best institution we can, uh, you know, by trying to ensure that we have resources, by trying to ensure that we can keep net price down as much as possible. We try and ensure that the, the students are getting the education and the counseling and that we can help them more than 
if not graduate on time, graduate on a better time period than they would otherwise, and just graduate, period. Uh, and one last point on that, I, I tell them, just like I would the counselors, some of the best things we do for kids is counsel a kid out of our institution. Mm, that's radical to say. It, it is. It is. Uh, a lot of people don't like it uh, when I do say it, but I think it's important to say, you know what, <laughs> you can see a kid and say, you know what, this isn't for you. You're probably not going to complete at this rate and you're burning up your financial aid money. Um, you know, go take a semester off or go to this college here that they're going to treat you better. You're not going to get lost there. You know, there, there's a lot of things, but there's some institutions. We talk about institutional fit. Not all kids fit in all institutions and vice versa. Well, thanks so much uh, for breaking these uh, items down. And uh, hopefully we can have you on as a, a regular guest from time to time because uh, I, I, there's information gaps and we don't know what we don't know. And how can we help students if we don't know what we don't know about these trends and how to prepare for them? So uh, thanks so much for uh, being on. Um, where can people find you and find your articles and find what you do? Well, go to educationalpolicy.org. Uh, that's our main site. I have also got my blog at theswaleletter.com. Uh, and then I'll make a little plug here. This is my new book, Stop Making Sense. And that's on Amazon.com uh, in Kindle format or in, or in book format. And it's also on uh, iBooks. So they can see that. Just search by Watson Scott Swale. And I've got four books up there right now. And it's more of the stuff we've been talking about. It's yeah. opinion-based. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you beat me to it. I was going to plug the book for you. But uh, if you're listening on the live stream link, if you look below, um, you'll see the uh, the preview page and take a look at uh, some of his other writings. So um, thanks so much. Appreciate for hanging in there with the tech difficulties. And uh, I'm really glad we had this conversation. And hopefully uh, we'll have some more about these topics. It's a pleasure. It's a good, good to see you again. It's thank been a few years. Yeah, thank you. See you too. Right. See you. Bye. Bye.